Hello, everybody. It's Heather Lee with Ghost Education 101, and I'm excited today to be joined by Leisha. She is going to be talking about spooky and haunted Christmas stories, so this should be a fun one to get everyone in the holiday spirit for tomorrow. Actually, not tomorrow, for Friday and Saturday. <laughs> it's been a long week already. Um, but before I pass it over to our favorite haunted librarian, I do want to let you guys know that at the end of this show, we are going to be introducing our new intro video for Ghost Education 101, because if you saw in the intro, it says 2021. We have a brand new one for 2022. So stay tuned for that as soon as we're done. So it's up to you. Um, how have you been? And tell everybody a little bit more about you and where you can find where they can find you before you get started with those stories. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. Um, well, I blog is The Haunted Librarian. So it's thehauntedlibrarian.com. I haven't been as active in the last um, couple of months because I have moved. Um, our family has moved back to Florida and I am busy settling in. And I'm actually going to take January off because um, there are a lot of boxes to unpack. <laughs> so, um, but I'm very excited because this is, honestly, this is the only program that I'm doing for December and I think including November as well because I love ghost education and I love sharing my stories. They're not my stories, but retelling stories that I find. So, um, so, I'm, uh, so I'm excited to be here and I will say, and I'll say this at the end, next year when I come on, on December 7th, I will have new Christmas stories. So it's not going to be a repeat of the six that I'm sharing tonight, it'll be new ones. And so some of the stories tonight, some of the viewers and um, audience um, or members, I guess, mm -hmm. might have heard because they're kind of more of the standard fare for Christmas. But next year, I promise to have something a little bit. Well, I can't say that because I'm not sure because I haven't really researched it. But um, I'm hoping to have something that maybe some um, all new stories for everybody. Well, we have you coming back next year several times. Um, I believe one of them is crime scene stories. Yes. Um, the, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm excited yeah, about that one because um, because some of you might be expecting me to because I've got my my notebook and, and my notes and stuff to talk about some um, Hunley House, Sauter Children, Lost in Family, and the Grime Sisters. Those four I'm actually not talking about tonight, even though they happened at Christmas time, because those are unsolved mysteries uh, or unsolved murders, and that's what I'm talking about in the next show, which is. Um, I think even more exciting. Mm -hmm. Yep, because we have that. And then you're also going to be talking about liabilities of operating your own haunted house, haunted yes. stories again, and then Christmas mm -hmm. stories again. So we're looking forward to those. Know, right. <laughs> that And the haunted house one is, uh, I wish I had thought of it earlier in the year to be able to do a program because the liability involved, you, you think it's a great opportunity for, as a fundraiser. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, how they got started was fundraisers for nonprofit organizations, but then the liability and then also the industry itself kind of took it over. And so you don't see a lot of nonprofits doing it because it, it, the legal ramifications are, um, they will bankrupt, bankrupt mm -hmm. organizations. Yep. So, yes. So there is a question. Um, I didn't ask you before because this is, a, uh, this is not how I usually do it. Um, mm -hmm. although I do like your, your studio setup, this yeah. is really nice. Um, is if I can share my screen. Yes, you can. Okay. Yep. Awesome. I, I suppose I should have showed you that before we got started. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. It is, it is quite all right. So yeah. It, um, how do I do it? <laughs> At the bottom, there should be a button for share. You have ah, your yes. settings. Okay. Share screen. Your screen. Oh, okay. Um, I can do the whole screen, I guess, because then I'm just put. I'm gonna pull PowerPoint up, so I just can't. I won't be able to see myself, but that's okay. okay. And I guess I won't be able to see questions. So if anybody has any questions, um, you can either Heather, you can either interrupt me, or we can wait till the end. Okay. Yeah, I'll keep a list of them, and we can do them at the end. Cool. So you ready? Yep, whenever you are. <laughs> awesome. Here we go. And you need to tell me if, um, if you, uh, can you see the screen now? Yep, you're good. Perfect. Yay. So Haunted Christmas. And this is actually kind of surprising to some people who didn't know that 
Christmas time was actually the time that people told ghost stories. And um, it was when people would sit by the fire. And uh, again, a lot of our traditions like Halloween traditions in America come from the United Kingdom, Great Britain. So do the Christmas retelling of the stories, but all, but Europe in general, because the weather's cold, the families are getting together. And so they're all sitting around and they're not distracted by electronics because they aren't invented yet. And so they start telling stories. And the most famous one is Charles Dickinson's A Christmas Carol. And um, it was published in 1843. And that's what people identify as being a Christmas story, right? But it's actually a ghost story. So here is a, um, in, uh, a print of a scene in England where people would gather around the tree and they would have candles on their Christmas trees lit, which is a fire hazard now. And they'd be running around and they'd be dressed up and they would have a full meal and then they would come together and they would start trying to scare people. Well, the stories I'm going to tell you tonight are actually real stories. They're, um, well, real being, I guess there's an asterisk behind it, beside it. Um, they're going to be uh, great tragedies, possibly, that happened at six locations. And the paranormal activity that is reported to be occurring at these locations. And I have them set in time order. So we're going to start in England and we're going to do three stories in England and then we're going to come over to the United States and I'm going to do three stories from the United States and they're going to be in reverse chronological order. So we're going to start with the oldest first. So let's go to England. Anne Boleyn. Poor Anne. Poor Anne. Um, we know Anne as being the unfortunate wife of Henry VIII, one of many. She um, actually was the Queen of England for three short years, from 1533 to 1536. And I apologize, I'm, I'm reading so that I get all my stories in, so you're seeing like the top of my head. But um, so she married the king. And it's interesting, um, she was actually pregnant before they got married. And some sources are always tell you will state that she delivered prematurely. She didn't. Um, Elizabeth, the first of England, who was the only surviving child of Anne, um, she actually was full term. So Anne was pregnant and Henry had a problem and he had to make some changes and she became queen, he became dissatisfied, and he sent her to her childhood home where we know she was beheaded for treason and other charges, which Henry probably made up, right? Um, because he liked to get rid of his problems. And so her date of birth is um, uh, 15, what is it, 1501, 1505? 1501. So she died actually um, 35 to 36 years old. And she is buried in Chapel Royal of St. Peter in London. But she is said to haunt her childhood home. Childhood home. And her childhood home is this beautiful place. Um, it's Hever Castle. It is located in the village of Hever in England. And it's 30 miles southeast of London. And this was the family home. It started out as a country house, smaller, but not that much smaller. And um, it was passed through the Bullen, which is the original or um, the precursor to Bolin, the Bullen family. And that's, that's important to the hauntings at Hever Castle. So she was sent to her childhood home. Um, where she spent her childhood, um, the house, the castle passed down through her father's line. And um, it then later became the possession of Henry's, King Henry VIII's fourth wife, right, Anna Cleves. The castle is open to the public. And so how the story got started was there was a man who um, go, went by his initials. It was... C.W. Bramford. 
C.W. Bramford was fascinated with ancestry and he was fascinated with the monarchy. He was British and he deeply believed that he was related or a descendant of the Bolin line, the Bolin back at that time, the Bolin line. And um, in 1976, he started conversations with the owner of the castle, who was Lord Astor. Lord Astor was a very wealthy man who owned the castle from, he owned it from 1960, where am I looking? 1962 to 1983. In 1976, before we had DNA testing, before we had Ancestry.com, Bramford was consumed with believing he was of noble blood. And so he visited the castle and um, he looked at um, publications, flyers of the castle. And there was one image that struck him as not being correct. And there was this image of Anne watching as her father greeted Henry into the, the family home. And he would, he was like, no, that's just not right. That's not how, that's not how she acted. That's not where she stood. And it's, he became so adamant about it that it was from a window. She was banging her fist on the wall or on the window. No, no, no. And so he started up this conversation with Lord Astor trying to correct the record. And so what's fascinating is a couple of things. One, Lord Astor really didn't have time for this man. Okay. But the second one is that Hever Castle fully embraced the story of Anne haunting the castle, which um, would be interesting, right? Because she lived there, um, she died there, but she's not buried there. And so Bramford, when he visited, he said he felt that he, Anne's vibration, her vibe, he, it would fill his body. And this is a direct quote. He said, these impressions were of a young woman, some 25 or 26 years of age in some distress, fists beating on the windowsill, scrabbling, her, uh, um, scrabbling of fingernails on the surrounding walls. I can definitely draw Anne's spirit within reach. And so the castle uh, kind of took on this, okay, we may be haunted and it might be Anne. And that kind of like um, settled or became local lore. And then in 2015, the Daily Mail, a British publication, actually published a story. And so the story was of uh, this man, Liam Archer, who visited the castle, took some pictures, but he claimed that he didn't really look at the pictures until three months later. And he swears that he caught the image of Anne Boleyn on camera. And he took the picture at the fireplace of her childhood home. And it's interesting because he says it's a hand coming across the screen, or excuse me, across the picture, and that's Anne's pointing, pointing where, where, where you all should look. And so this is the image. This, and, and I tried to get images for the six stories that I'm sharing tonight, but I could only find them for two because people don't post them. And some of them were before we had cell phones or modern technology, but that's supposed to be Anne's hand. And, and I think that we can say he probably was moving his camera quickly caught somebody pointing and it got captured onto the film, double exposure. And so that probably isn't Anne, but it doesn't minimize the stories or the vibrations that other guests feel. And so um, not only is her apparition seen in the window here pointing toward a fireplace, but people do say that they see her wandering the gardens of the castle, often drifting over the bridge that crosses River Eden. And her ghost is also said to appear at Christmas time. And so that's how it's related to a Christmas ghost story. And it, um, she's also believed to manifest under an oak tree where Henry courted her. So that is the, the tragedy of Anne Boleyn, but go and visit Heber Castle and see if you can get some better imagery. So the next story, 
Oh, wait, I have another picture. Um, so sorry about that. This, this one I, I almost didn't include because you're kind of looking at it and it's like, what am I supposed to be looking at? And then, so this is off the internet. Um, the picture on the left is the image upper. They've put it in a box for us to help us and then a blow up of it. I'm not convinced, but I'm not saying that Anne doesn't haunt the castle. It's just that sometimes we just can't capture it, the evidence on film or on our cell phones. Whoops. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So now we have Ruse Hall and Ruse Hall is also sometimes called Rose Hall. And so this is a true manor house. It's not a castle. It's a manor house. And it is outside of England or um, outside Suffolk in Beckles. And it derives its name from the, um, the family de Ruse. And so it kind of sounds like Rose. And so they, Rose Hall. And they owned the building when it was built in 1583. 1583. So the first castle, Heber Castle, was um, inherited into Anne's family in the early 1500s, 1505. And um, it was actually in the family starting in 1462. So 1462, now we're at 1583. This is said to be one of the most haunted houses in England. Actually, you have two two of the most haunted houses in England. And so we can debate on which one is more haunted. But this one is said to be um, the most haunted house in England, not necessarily for the number of ghosts, which will be the next story, but because of the impact of the hauntings. And so this one is said to have a devil's footprint imprinted on one of its walls. And I couldn't get a picture of the footprint. I would I would love to go go to these houses and see. It was owned by the Suckling family in the 17th century, and Sir John Suckling bought it in 1600. And so upon his death, the house was inherited by Sir Alexander Temple, the brother-in-law. And it was because he received the house in lieu of payment for a debt that was owed to him. And that's how a lot of these houses actually passed to people, members of families within the, over, the larger extended family was because of debts. And so he um, got it to as repayment for a debt, but actually the Suckling family worked very hard to actually purchase it from him to bring it back into the family. And then it passed to the rich family upon the marriage of John Suckling's widow to Sir Edwin Rich. And so this house is famous for two things, the house itself and then the grounds. And so the most infamous paranormal connection is that of a headless horseman. And so um, we, get, we get a headless horseman story from England. Yay, right? Um, they love horses and headless horsemen visiting. And it is said that the headless horseman would appear on the grounds every Christmas Eve night because in Europe and um, back past traditions were that people actually celebrated, celebrated Christmas on Christmas Eve with the family, with the opening of the gifts and the telling of the ghost stories. And then Christmas Day was spent in, in prayer for prayerful contemplation. And so Christmas Eve, you're supposed to see the headless horseman on the grounds. So when darkness falls on December 24th, the headless horseman's carriage is pulled down the long driveway. So if you look in the picture on the left, you see this long, slightly winding driveway. You see it coming. You hear the clack of the horses and the wheels spinning and you, and you see the headless horseman. Um, no one really knows why a headless horseman. <laughs> that's the that's an interesting little caveat to the story. And um, we can kind of theorize that Christmas Eve, because that's when the family would be there, the windows would be lit and to feel the presence. On the right hand side, you can see current 
day, modern day, what the Ruse Hall looks like now. But probably what's more haunted or more striking or more infamous, more infamous is the hanging tree. And so on the left hand side, we see this beautiful tree gorgeous tree and it's set off with fencing so that people don't actually trespass because unfortunately people like to go to these locations and trespass and sometimes they don't do really nice things there sometimes they set candles on um, they light candles and the candles burn the place down so they have the fencing around this beautiful tree which is called the hanging tree so Many centuries ago, this was the site of a giblet. A giblet stood in this in the place of where the tree is. And a giblet was actually, it, it was a form of public execution, but it wasn't a hanging. It was where the person was placed in a metal cage and left to the elements. And so that person would be exposed to the ele elements. There wouldn't be a roof. There, there wouldn't be food. Um, and left in the cage until he or she died. And so the giblet that stood on Ruse Hall actually facilitated the deaths of hundreds of local criminals. And um, can you just imagine all that energy in that location? Well, it was eventually replaced by the oak tree. And so we have this tree and instead of placing the person in the cage, leaving the person to the elements, they decided to start hanging. And so they were hanging people from this tree. And it's said that there was a lady dressed in white and you can see her where she died, um, supposedly hung from the tree. And she walks around the tree six times in an attempt to summon the devil. Away from the tree and towards the building itself, visitors um, have reported seeing a face of a young, pale girl waving in the window. And so the third instance of the, um, actually fourth, if you want to talk, we've got the devil's imprint, we've got the headless horseman coming down the road, we've got the hanging tree, and now on the right-hand side is supposed to be a picture of a girl waving to um, visitors. And if you're looking, it might be hard for you to see, she's in the middle plane, or pane rather, she's in the middle pane, and sh her nose is facing to my right. And so you kind of see her in profile. She's not waving full face, she's in profile on the side. And so visitors mentioned seeing her in the window. People, have tried to identify or go back and do research to identify who the little girl might be. And they think that um, she was actually there um, on the property. And there is an author researcher who grew up nearby on a farm named Janet Sawyer. And she collected many stories about Ruse Hall and wrote a historical novel, which she called Jess of Ruse Hall. And so she named her Jess. And um, she said, a few years ago, I went for a walk along Putting Moor on a dismal morning and it was very gloomy. And I said to my aunt, that house looks odd. It needs a story written about it because it must be haunted. So she took down um, different sightings from family and friends and wrote the book, Jess of Roos Hall, which was published in 2007. And she said, this is a spooky hall. Not only has it been haunted, but I've haunted, I've been haunted too by the many stories. I was sometimes not entirely sure who was writing this book. So were the ghosts calling her to write this book to share the stories? Unfortunately, Roos Hall is not open to the public, hence the fence around the hanging tree. And so um, unless you're invited by invitation, you can't visit it. Um, and I'm not sure how you would get close enough to be able to see into the window, but please do not trespass. Do not trespass. Wow, isn't that a beautiful home? <laughs> a beautiful home. It's not Highcliffe or 
I can't remember the name of Downton. Um, it, that's not down. Um, this is Bram's Hill House. And Bram's Hill House was on the market for sale. And so for 10 million pounds as of 2020, you could have purchased Bram's, Bram's Hill House in England. And it is gorgeous. And I couldn't find any information online if it actually had sold or if it's still available. COVID has kind of thrown off um, some of the real estate market. But um, it is in um, Northeast Hampshire, and it is one of the largest homes to me in, um, in England, and it is in the Jacobian style of manor house called a mansion, and we have Bram's Hill, and it was built in the 17th century by the 11th Baron, but it was partially destroyed by fire and rebuilt. So it is a 10 bedroom mansion and it has served as apartments for kings and royalty. And so it was um, a vacation spot. I don't know. But it eventually was sold and became a police college. And so the um, college was training police officers. And so a lot of the stories that came come from this house are eyewitness, eyewitness testimony from police cadets. And so it is 43,000 square feet. It sits on 92 acres, it has parkland, woodland, lake, and its own herd of deer. And it was um, on a site that was previously owned by Henry VIII. And it comes complete with a banquet hall, chapel, cinema, gym, and wine cellar. So for 10 million pounds, which would be like 13 million US, you could own a piece of British history and it's beautiful. It is gorgeous. Um, it dates back to the Doomsday Book of 1086, and it was bought in 1603 by Edward La Zouch. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he was the Baron. And he was actually a favorite of King James I. And he wanted to make a statement. Um, and so what he did was he actually tore down Henry VIII's house. Um, vacation house. I don't know. Um, he tore that down and built this beautiful building. This house is supposed to be haunted with no less than 14 ghosts, 14 ghosts. And so this one is also vying for the title of England's most haunted, but the hauntings of this house are, um, more docile than the hanging tree or the devil's imprint on the wall. And so it, it's fabulous, right? So among the 14 ghosts reputed to haunt the house, the one that's probably the most famous is the bride who locked herself in a chest. And so I'm going to talk about her last. <laughs> and so, like I said, this used to be a college for police cadets. So it was a police college. And so the um, police officers are in, or cadets who are in training, a lot of them are the eyewitness testimony that are coming out. And so the, a listing of 13 of the 14 ghosts include one, a lady in gray. And um, it suggests that she was married to a man who was a religious dissenter. He was anti-church. And so she was beheaded in the 17th century. So we have Lady in Gray. Then we have the green man. And um, this is a man who's dressed in green. And he either drowned in the lake in 1806 or he threw himself off a cliff near Brighton. And so it's one or the other, but he liked green and he appears. And uh, he, he manifests, sightings of him are around the lake. And um, in some report that he may have been the gardener of this property. And so the lady in gray who haunts, She's supposed to haunt the terrace, which would be 
the backside of the first floor, the library, and the um, chapel. And so she was, um, people claimed to see a young, beautiful woman dressed in gray, but she's sad as if she's crying. And um, with golden hair and smelling of lilies of the valley. And so the golden hair could be, it's not blonde, but it's like a reddish golden when the sun hits it, or I'm not the sun, because well, I don't know if people see her in the sun, but they um, it's golden brown or reddish brown hair. Then we have her husband, the religious dissenter, who is supposedly haunting the stables, excuse me, and the chapel. Then the fifth ghost is that of a young child, and the child is haunting two rooms, the library and another room, and you can, um, people claim to be, to hear her crying. And she likes to come up and hold visitors' hands. So she seems to be the one who actually interacts the most with visitors, whereas the other ones might possibly be um, not intelligent. The child seems to be intelligent. And they believe, um, people who have done research believe that she may be the child of the gray lady and the religious dissenter who both haunt, um, also, who all haunt the grounds. Then um, there is a lady who is dressed in the age of Queen Anne. She is not Queen Anne, but of that time period and no one really knows who she is but they just notice the dress and the clothing she wears then the seventh ghost is a knight in armor and he seems to appear in the chapel the chapel seems to be um, the most active place in the hall or in the house then um, another ghost or spirit haunting the chapel is a lady in 17th century dress. And then we also have a nun, a nun haunting the chapel. The 10th ghost is a young man dressed in 1920s tennis attire. So um, he is believed to be a Cope family member. And the Cope family is the family who owned the property um, prior to it going to the local government who ran the, the college. And so it is believed that the man dressed in the 1920s tennis attire fell off a train. And he is supposedly in the reception area. So right when you walk through the doors, right in that area, the atrium area. Then the 11th ghost is a small boy who is supposed to be haunting the terrace, and he is said to have fallen off of the roof sometime in the 18th century. And then the 12th ghost is an old man with a gray beard, thought to be the husband of a white lady, and he stares through the, um, the windows out. But like I said, the most famous ghost of Bramsell is the bride, the bride. And so it is the legend of the mistletoe bow. And so we have pictures. Some of you might have heard this story. This is actually this is actually a story that has been carried over um, into American literature, and I'm sure probably in other literature, but it is um, the story of a woman who on her wedding night was in her wedding dress and she and her um, groom were playing games. They were playing hide and seek. And so she dress, she's dressed in her white attire. She chooses to hide in this chest and she gets stuck and the groom never finds her. And she's not discovered until 50 years later and she's deceased. 
And so um, when she's found, she's still wearing her dress and there is a sprig of mistletoe in her hand, hence the name, the mistletoe bow. And, um, it, and it's, it's sad, right? And so the chest that she was found in was displayed in the front reception area of the house for years. And so sometimes um, people have tried to identify who she was. Some researchers believe her to be the um, John Cope's daughter, Anne, who was married um, to Hugh Bethel, um, the Cope family. Others believe that she is Genevieve Orsini, who was married in 1727, and that she is from Italy. And so it was a bride who played this game of hide and seek with her husband in Italy and was trapped in the chest and the spirit attached to the chest. And she was brought to the, to the um, house, the manor, through, by the chest. And so they don't know. Um, and it is said that um, Sir William Cope, who owned the house, said that he was describing the chest and he described it to be large enough to fit a woman of comely proportions. <laughs> and he had tested it by lying down inside of it to show that somebody could actually fit in it. Um, he did not get locked into it, but um, the um, woman who owned the house by marriage, she actually had the chest removed from the house. And so the chest that visitors to um, Bramshill, when they come into the reception area, the chest that they see now is actually a replica. And a lot of people don't know that. So there is, um, people don't know who the bride is attached to this chest. And she is referred to as the lady in white or the white lady. And she also haunts the room that the child plays in. It is said that a noble uh, royalty from Romania, Michael I, asked to be moved to another room in the house when he stayed the night because he did not like being disturbed by the woman in white who passed through his bedroom every night. And so um, this is a house that can be um, seen. However, I do believe that when I checked, it's actually closed due to COVID, but um, this is a location that you can, you can actually go and see and ex see if you can experience one of the, or more of the 14 ghosts. I only know of 13. I don't know what the 14th, 14th one is. Um, I will look into that though. That would be kind of exciting. I just love how the stories come and get shared and then they they just kind of evolve into an American story. And, um, and, and this is like one of those stories that we would hear at a campfire. So let's come across the pond to America. And so the first story that we are going to talk about is in Wisconsin. And um, this is the Ridgeway ghost of Wisconsin, probably one of the most famous Wisconsin ghost stories. And um, probably because it's not merely a ghost story, it's actually a phantom story, a phantom activity that actually goes on in this area. And people claim to see a ghost of a man with a whip and um, he will either chase them or walk with them um, down a path. Um, they might see him chasing animals. He might be an animal. That's the phantom theory that he actually transforms himself into into an animal or a headless horseman. He's also has the ability to change into a young man or woman, apparently also. And so um, people believe that the Ridgeway ghost is actually a combination of ghosts and the combination of two brothers who had the misfortune, right? They unfortunately were murdered um, in a bar fight sometime in the early 1840s. 
and um, in a bar in the village of Blue Mounds in the town of Dodgeville in Wisconsin. And so this was a mining area. And so they were possibly miners in the bar, got into a fight and they were killed. There is a belief that the sightings um, of the Ridgeway ghost were cyclical and that um, they would be most active in 40 year increments. So um, 1890s, 1930s, 1970s, so we get 80s, 90s, 10. So this past um, decade would have seen some activity of this, but unfortunately, the house is no longer there. But um, according to one story, Dr. Cutler was the first to announce seeing the Ridgeway Phantom. He claimed to see the Phantom appear on a pole of his wagon while he was riding home one night past the house of a deceased person. And so a man named John Lewis claimed that some supernatural agency, that's his quote, or um, his term supernatural agency was the cause of his ailments and he died as a result of seeing the Ridgeway ghost. In 1902, the New York Times actually had an article, and here's just a clip of the article. The article actually is talking about several famous Wisconsin ghost stories. So if you are interested in that, um, here it is from December 7th, 1902. And just a little side note, ghost stories were filler in newspapers. And so they would, people... Um, and, and think of it, right? If the newspaper and there wasn't a lot of tragedy going on, if the nation wasn't at war, there wasn't great tragedy, they welcomed ghost stories because it was a form of entertainment. And so that's how we have um, New York Times, right? Publishing these stories. That's how Mothman actually got picked up and um, people read about it in the late 1960s was because it got picked up by the AP wire service and was sold to local newspapers. And so people would read this. This is um, one of the cool things about researching is that I can go back into a newspaper and go to the late 1800s, early 1900s and find articles on hauntings that were published in local newspapers because it, it wasn't taboo. It was, this was fodder. This was entertainment form. And so um, the paper reported that John Lewis, and this is a quote, a prosperous farmer living in the vicinity of Ridgeway, a man of sober life and undaunted courage cut through the fields one night after helping a neighbor with some butchering. Climbing a stone wall, his attention was arrested by the sight of a figure that seemed to have gathered itself together out of the just now tenantless air and stood confronting him in a menacing attitude. What descriptors, right? So he was helping his neighbor butcher some animals. He was walking home, but he didn't drink, right? He led us over life. And he encountered this phantom and he fled, but the ghost stepped across his path and raised its arm. Next morning, a neighbor found Lewis lying inside the wall in a semi-conscious condition. He said he had been hurled in the air as if in the vortex of a cyclone, pounded, crushed into insensibility. He died a few hours after he was carried home, asserting with his dying breath that he had come to his end by a super, supernatural agency. Yeah, so he was going home sober, encountered somebody and was lifted into the air and spun and found semi-conscious, but died of the Ridgeway ghost. Um, Local people did tell of different stories similar to this. Well, not similar to the extent of the cyclones, but these sightings of these this phantom person between 1840 and 1900. Um, but reports did taper off over the years, right? Um, probably because we stopped telling these stories and passing it along. And the mysterious manifestations um, occurred until 1993 was the last time people actually talked about it. 
and it probably had to do with the um, house collapsing in ruins, right? People weren't reminded of it, weren't looking for it, probably weren't walking anymore either. So this is a story for you to go out on a walk. <laughs> like Christmas Eve, get your lantern and go for a walk and see what stories you can find. I love it. This is beautiful, right? Um, the unfortunate de um, demise of Mr. John Lewis. This probably is an in, in image most of you know. This is Alcatraz, right? Alcatraz. Alcatraz was built to be um, built to break the spirit of criminals. And um, the most rebellious criminals in the United States were sent to Alcatraz. It's no longer a prison, but this is where a lot of stories come out of. Um, you can see online some paranormal groups, some paranormal television shows did investigations at Alcatraz. But in 1933, the United States government decided to open a maximum security prison um, that had minimum privileges. <laughs> it, it was meant to be horrible. Um, it, it, it was meant to be the worst of the worst were supposed to be sent to Alcatraz. And so um, prisoners breaking the rules at Alcatraz would be sent to the strip cell. And the strip cell is exactly what you think it is. It's where um, it, it's the hole, but worse because it's where the prisoners were stripped of all their clothing and placed in the hole with no lights, no food, no sink, no mattress, no toilet, no toilet. There was a hole in the ground. Um, this is a maximum security prison for men, for men. And, um, horrible conditions um, that these criminals were sent to. And, um, and so the, it is believed that because of the horrible conditions of Alcatraz, it is why it is one of the most haunted locations in the United States. And I, I will say I've never been to Alcatraz. Uh, I'm not sure I would want to go to Alcatraz, to be honest with you, because it just seems like such a sad place. But um, yeah, it's, it is sad. And so the most famous cell in Alcatraz is cell 14D. And that is the cell that you see on TV. Um, and it is supposed to be the cell where an inmate died after screaming that a creature was going to kill him. And um, he was found dead. Many visitors say that they felt extreme coldness wrapping around them in the room. And um, feel that vibration that the man at Anne Boleyn's house felt um, in that cell. Visitors often report a raw coldness enveloping the room and just like passing through them. Cell blocks A, B, and C also are where people tour and believe that they can hear moaning and crying from prisoners. And the spirit of the butcher, the butcher is supposed to be in um, that area. And he was known to be assassinated here in the 1940s. One of the most famous prisoners of Alcatraz was Al Capone, right? Um, Alphonse Gabriel Capone, also known as Scarface. What's interesting is that Al Capone actually didn't spend a lot of his time in prison in prison in Alcatraz. He actually um, did a little layover in Atlanta, by the way. Um, but Scarface, um, his cell is, um, it's a typical cell that you can see. What is it? Um, East, is it East Penn State? Um, the penitentiary that he spent is um, the lavishness. If you see a picture of a cell that Al Capone stayed in, he stayed like it was like the hotel, right? He was at the Hilton. No, in the prison he was incarcerated at. The one with um, the um, 
record player, the lush tapestries and so forth was not Alcatraz. Um, Alcatraz, he was sent there to break his spirit and um, because he was getting away with a lot of stuff while in prison. And so his bed looks similar. His cell would have been similar to the ones that you see on the internet. It's not necessarily his, what his look like then, because it would have uh, changed over time before it was made um, public for viewings and the prison was closed. But he was sent there to break his spirit. And um, he spent the last of his years of incarceration at Alcatraz. He did not die in Alcatraz. He, um, because he didn't have the luxuries that he had at the prior prisons he was incarcerated at, he um, took up banjo playing at Alcatraz. <laughs> and so, excuse me. So he was in prison there from 1934 to 1939 um three years or um four and a half years rather and people um he was so afraid that he was going to be killed um at Alcatraz for daring to play the banjo I don't know why I mean I think they probably would kill him because he's Al Capone but anyhow he um played the banjo in the bathroom right in the shower area which would probably be fantastic acoustics and so a, some visitors hear banjo music when they visit and so um, they attribute it to Al Capone he did serve four and a half years there and Al Capone <laughs> suffered from syphilis right um because um he was living the gangster lifestyle and um contracted syphilis and it was eating away at his mind and so he um had um mental illness and so he was actually transported and or transferred from Alcatraz and he spent his life the remainder of his life at Terminal Island Prison in Southern California for the rest of his sentence um, to receive medical care. But interestingly enough, I'm not fascinated really with Al Capone and the banjo music. I'm fascinated with who would want to be a warden of, Al of Alcatraz, right? Who would want to be the man in charge of the worst prison in America that is supposed to break the human spirit? And um, James Johnson is that man. He was the warden during the time that Al Capone was at Alcatraz. And it, it's interesting because he would shut down rumors of Alcatraz being haunted. He, he didn't have time for, for these stories. And um, it says Alcatraz, um, he was first warden, James Johnson, shut down the idea saying, um, <laughs> um, shut down ideas of ghosts there. But he also wanted to be known as the man who broke Al Capone. And so he said that um, it looks like Alcatraz has me licked, has me licked. But James threw a Christmas party. He threw a Christmas party. And I have, um, oh, here's Al Capone, right? Scarface, he um, was also known as because he had the scar. Um, but that's James Johnson right there. And um, this is a um, meme coming from Weird History that says, Alcatraz's most famous warden. He was the first warden. Um, he was the one... Um, I don't know. I'm not sure how, what kind of man he was. Um, said he didn't believe in ghosts, but could never explain the time he heard a woman crying as he gave a group of people a tour by the dungeon. The sobbing seemed to be coming from the wall, but just as it stopped, an icy wind blew in the room and startled everyone. So he didn't believe in the ghost, um, some of which he probably created. But he also had this supernatural or paranormal experience. This is a sample of the Christmas menu from Alcatraz from 1954. So um, they had festivities. Um, the worst prison in the United States did surrender a little bit, um, played some music. They had some, uh, they had a Catholic mass. They had 
uh, movie. And then on the right side, you can see what they, um, the Christmas feast, which isn't very different than what we have now, which is kind of, kind of cool in a way. But um, Alcatraz, people also attribute the hauntings of Alcatraz to the Native American Indians who used to control the island. Um, who They didn't own the island, but they had control of the island. And um, they would um, banish, they would send their criminals to the island um, for punishment. And um, so they think that some of the supernatural paranormal activity might come from the Native Americans, but also because of the federal prison, right? Um, the prison was shut down, by the way, in 1963. But there was a Christmas feast there that Johnson held. Um, and so he... In the 1940s, so this is after Al Capone had left, but he had other famous gangsters at, um, in, um, in prison. He held a Christmas party at his residence for the staff of the prison. And it, um, it is claimed to say that the festive occasion came to a swift halt when an apparition sporting mutton chop whiskers and a gray suit appeared. The temperature in the room plummeted, it got incredibly cold, and the fire blew out before returning to normal when the spirit disappeared about a minute later. The rattled guards were too scared to stay in the residence, and the rest of the Christmas celebration abruptly ended. So Mr. Johnson's holiday party in the 1940s came to a quick end by possibly a ghost with mutton chops. Good for the ghost. The last story that I'm going to share is from the 1970s. This is an image of Flight 401 after it crashed in the Everglades in Florida. An interesting little side note, um, my dad was supposed to be on this flight and he missed it. Um, he was, we're from Florida. My dad was in real estate development. He was in marketing, more or less marketing, um, great places like Cape Coral, Florida. And, um, he was actually flying back from New York or he was supposed to be flying back from New York to Miami, but he got a little sidetracked, which was probably a, a, a good thing. But, um, flight 401 was an Eastern airlines flight that was traveling from New York through Atlanta to Miami. And um, it was, um, or I'm sorry, it was New York to Miami. And um, there's there are transcripts online that you can read of the flight problems that they were having on the flight. And as they were approaching Miami, there was a light that came on that, um, or didn't come on rather, um, that the um, landing gear was down. And so, the cockpit crew was was trying to figure out if the landing gear had come out and come down. They circled a little bit. And before they realized what was happening, the plane was descending too quickly and it crashed into the Everglades. Um, what's incredibly tragic about this event is not only that it was a crash that was one of the deadliest plane crashes in the United States history, the cockpit crew was so focused on a uh, a light that didn't come on it was the light bulb was actually burnt out and so that's what kind of precipitated the plane from crashing so years later a flight engineer on another eastern airlines plane um and so this would have been an a lockheed l-1011-1 tristar to me so that was their fleet of planes was the l-1011 and so a flight engineer was on this atlanta atlanta to miami route and he was surprised to have an encounter with the, another Eastern Airlines crew member who was sitting in his seat, but he was jumping, um, 
jumping the flight, jump seat, jump seats. So um, crews, a little, I digress a little bit. Airline crews usually don't live in the city of from which the planes are flying from, right? Um, they jump seats to get to the airport that they're going to be flying out of. Um, the um, crew itself, especially pilots, right? Because pilots change and um, go up into classifications of the airlines or the planes. And so this flight engineer was on this plane. He saw another crew member who was in his uniform, but not part of the crew for the flight. And the stranger said to him, you don't need to worry about the pre-flight. And then the man disappeared in uniform, disappeared. What startled the engineer was the engineer knew this man. And he knew this man to be a friend of his, um, someone who he knew named Don Repo. But the problem was Don was dead because Don was the flight engineer in Flight 401 that crashed in the Everglades. So Don, um, Don was the flight engineer and one of the 101 people who died on December 29th, 1972. The flight was coming down from New York. It was two days before New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, and it was packed. Um, it was a packed flight, and people were starting to celebrate going down to Miami. Um, there, um, the survivors of the flight said there were people who were, you know, drinking. They were drunk. They were passed out. They were sleeping. It, it was a very joyful um, vibe. On, on the plane. And so the holiday travelers um, on this packed flight where it slammed into the Everglades, 19 miles northwest of Miami, Miami International Airport, um, 75 people survived. At that time, 1972, it was the deadliest single plane accident in the United States. Investigators later determined that while the crew was distracted with a front landing gear, the um, plane itself coasted and descended. And so what happened was the crew was distracted by the light not coming on and didn't realize that the plane was descending quickly and, and it crashed. The, um, the crew members, um, the pilot it was Robert Loft. He died at um, at the crash scene. Um, Albert Stockstill and Don Repo died after, but as a result of the crash. And so immediately following, not like immediately, but uh, like days um, thereafter, strange reports kept com coming in. And some of the reports of the paranormal activity was from the Everglades at the crash site. And so um, you have, there was um, on the right hand side, I have a piece from an article out of an AP story about the crash. Um, this one says 65 survivors, and I think it is 65. There's a website that actually has the survivors, they um, track them. Um, one of the people who did survive was another engineer who was in a jump seat and he, he survived. But um, when the plane crashed in the Everglades, there was a man out on his airboat and he was out looking for frogs because frogs are big, the legs are juicy and they eat them. And he, and um, his airboat actually was um, being inundated with crash debris. And so people witness out at the crash site in the Everglades, strange lights and um, seeing things. And then let me see if I can pull it. Where is it? Because I'm jumping ahead of my story. Um, for months and years after the crash, the area became a hotbed of supernatural activity. So lights started popping up in the swamp. Um, the um, hunters who would be out in the Everglades would see eyes, not the eyes of alligators, but specters. And um, they would see people, ghosts, dressed in rags and tattered clothes. But after 
the crash, the plane went down. Within months, spite, um, sightings began happening on other Lockheed L-1011s. And which was interesting because people didn't understand what the connection was. And so stories started being spread of crews and attendants and passengers who would see Don Repo and they would see Captain Robert Loft on other Eastern planes. Um, and so people started trying to theorize what was the relationship between Don and Robert to these L-1011s, and it was the equipment. And they started believing that pieces of the plane that were salvageable made their way into other L-1011 planes. Eastern Airlines denied it. Um, to, to this day, it's being de denied. Um, but that's how um, people believe that the relationship is. And so John Fuller is an author. He collected all these stories that became the 1976 bo book, The Ghost of Flight 401, which was actually made into a 1978 TV, made for television movie. And he, he found all these witnesses who swore that they, they saw Don, excuse me, they saw Robert um, on the planes. And um, Fuller said that there were just too many stories and too many specific things that the witnesses would be telling them for him to believe that this was just folklore that was just being uh, an urban legend that was just being passed along. So the sightings were always on L-1011s not other planes, always the same plane. They faded by the end of 1974. And so Fuller, the author, claims that Eastern management denied the sightings uh, or denied these incidents, denied that um, the crew and the flight crew saw them. And there was this rumor that Eastern Airlines actually sent out an internal memo saying that any crew member found discussing the connection of flight Eastern Flight 401 to any hauntings would be fired, um, which is pretty severe. And there are no official reports to support them. Employees wouldn't be, wouldn't come forward to Fuller because they were afraid they were going to lose their jobs. And flight log pages detailing incidents of the hauntings were torn out and disappeared. But um, the person who ran public relations for Eastern, Jim Ashlock, said there was never anything to it. And he said that um, Fuller made the whole thing up to sell his book, that there were no hidden logs, um, logs weren't destroyed, documents weren't destroyed, and Eastern Airlines did not witness, intimidate witnesses. Um, Eastern Airlines is no longer in existence. They folded in 1991. Um, Jay Repo believed the story of Eastern not having these sightings. Um, he was the one of the four children of Don, and he believed him up until he was getting married. And then, um, Or I'm sorry, he did believe the stories because he believed them because he believed that Don would show up and visit him. But on his wedding night, when he and the bride went into their Miami hotel, they didn't tell anybody that they which hotel they were going to be at. There were a pair of plastic Eastern Airlines or a, a pair of plastic Eastern Airline wings. Um, back in the day, Eastern would give little kids wings pens with wings um, were found in the hotel room. I'm not sure how I feel about that. That's sad. But like I said, not only were the sightings on the planes, the different or the L-1011s, but also in the Everglades. And um, it's the activities died down with development. So it's interesting. So there's this belief that some of the wreckage found its way into Eastern flight. Um, 
And in fact, I actually think, and I didn't think to look this up. I actually think I saw like a 60 minutes episode on her or something, but I don't know. But some of the wreckage actually is at the, um, or in the archives at the history center in Miami. And people believe that that piece of the floorboard is cursed and, um, Ed and Lorraine Warren's occult museum also has some of the wreckage in their museum. So I don't know if um, Johnny Zaffis didn't open up his museum. He in he has some of the um, Warren's items, and I wonder if that's in his collection or if it's in the son-in-law's. But it, it is interesting, right? Um, it's it's sad. So this is me, The Haunted Librarian. I can be found at www.thehauntedlibrarian.com. And I'm going to stop sharing to see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, so far no questions have come through. So if anyone does have any questions, feel free to ask. But great stories. <laughs> I know, great, like sad, right? Tragedy. <laughs> great, great in the sense that they're interesting. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it, it is interesting. Um, so like I had heard, like I had heard the story of the bride in the chest, um, being passed down in American lore, but, um, but I, I didn't really think that it would be attached to an actual house or castle or, or anything, mm -hmm. but, um, but I, um, but I've been to, um, Let's see. Not the. I haven't been to Bram's Cell House. I would like to go and see if I can find the fourteen ghosts. But um, I I've actually visited Hever Castle, and um, and they talk about it being haunted by Anne Boleyn, and I just love that. I, I love how over in England they welcome the discussion of hauntings, but we don't over here. And Philip and I have talked about that like ad nauseum probably mm -hmm. on other um sessions, but. I just love it when I go to a location and they're like, yeah, you know, right like in Fort Myers, um, the Edison home. My, um, so my mom didn't grow up in Fort Myers, but I did, but, um, she came to Fort Myers, um, when she was in high school left and came back and she's like, yeah, it was like, you know, we would talk about how the Edison's home was haunted and she had some stories and stuff. And so, um, I guess about 10 years ago, I took my daughter and our, um, international student there and i'm like so tell me about the ghost stories and they're like there are no ghost stories i'm like oh man i got the docent who sucks <laughs> so yeah i know is it just us yeah it's just us it's <laughs> quiet tonight <laughs> that's okay so no you know that's okay mm -hmm. um it's Christmas mm. and, um, you know, and going through COVID and everything, I'm not sure haunted Christmas stories <laughs> has an audience this year. Know. Well, who, who knows? I mean, who knows? There's people watching and people have said it's very interesting and that they're enjoying it. So <laughs> those who are watching are enjoying it. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> um, and, and I wanted to kind of do a variety of, of them because just to kind of mix it up a little bit and i didn't want to do kids <laughs> that's kind of sad at christmas but um actually mandy wants to know um where did they remove the chest to storage or to, where they remove the chest for storage um the um brams uh, brams brams hill house chest I, you know honestly i think it might have been destroyed because the um woman who inherited it through marriage, the, the house um, was, didn't like it and was like, she had it removed. She was like, get this out of my house. But people heard the stories and would show up to pay to come to the house and they'd be like, where's the chest? And so I think that's how they probably got a um, reproduction of it. Mm -hmm. okay. It's kind of a bummer, you know. I'm not sure I'd want to see a reproduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because <laughs> that, that's just and, and I'm, I think it's so cool if it was an attachment, if it came from Italy 
and was attached to the chest because I would love to know um, the province of the chest mm -hmm. in Italy and see. But it's just, it, it's like you, um, you don't know where things um, come from, right? Mm -hmm. Like I had, um, I have a colleague who can't shop in charity shops and, um, you know, for use furniture because she walks in and she's so sensitive to it. She's like, mm -hmm. nope, can't own you. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and I never really thought about that um, until she, she and I were talking one day and I'm like, yeah, I guess, you know, to be that sensitive, to be able to, to feel it. Um, but I also want to know if this, um, what is his name? C.W. Bramford is if he's still alive and if he's done DNA profiling through ancestry, if he really is a Bolin, because I don't think he is. Right. right? Yeah, that and, would be interesting to find out. Yeah. Like statistically, <laughs> well, I guess with the inbreeding and whatnot or the affairs, mm -hmm. not the inbreeding, but the affairs, maybe. Right. Um, but <laughs> to believe so much, he probably was just a psychic and just kind of probably he might have just got confused understanding what he was feeling and thought it was because he had this blood connection where it might have just been he was just psychic mm -hmm. i don't know so okay. well thank you for these stories they were amazing Oh, thank As you. always, <laughs> looking forward to our next series of stories from you <laughs> the murder mysteries are going to be really cool because mm -hmm. i am I love the crime shows. Mm -hmm. I love them. So um, those I'm going to see if I can get some more pictures and stuff. Not, not nothing graphic or anything. <laughs> um, or I'll put up a warning. But yeah, that one, that one, I, I mean, I, I was looking forward to this one, but the mm -hmm. crime scene ones, I just don't understand how some crimes remain unsolved. Right. So that one's yeah. going to be good. It, it, thank you for having me. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Yes, thank um, you all. Yep, real quick, we will be back in January 5th, 2022, and we will be joined by the host of the Apocalypse Project. These two guys are amazing. They've interviewed me several times. I have a blast with them every time. We're going to talk about different paranormal stories and encounters that they've had, and then also talk about how to host your own podcast. They're going to offer tips and tricks on hosting a paranormal podcast. So make sure you join us for that one. And as promised, we are going to close out this show with our new introduction as soon as I can pull it up for 2022. So thank you again, guys, for joining us. And we will see you in two weeks. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Thank you again. Have a great night.